mowing the lawn, just just being stuck in the same house day after day, looking at the same, you know, having to drive. Uh, all, all of you know what I really don't like about conventional living in a house is that you're completely cut off from nature. Yeah. Uh, out here on the ocean, I'm surrounded by water. I'm surrounded by nature. When when the sun goes down, it's dark. When the sun comes up in the morning, it's light. Uh, there's birds. There's fish. There's no roads there's no telephone poles there's no concrete there's no other buildings it's, it's nature and that's what makes me happy hi friends this is read and write with natasha podcast my name is natasha tines and i'm an author and a journalist in this channel i talk about the writing life review books and interview authors hope you enjoy the journey Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Read and Write with Natasha. So today we have with us a sailor author. Uh, his name is Paul Trammell, and he lives on his sailboat and is currently in Panama. Uh, he wrote a number of uh, uh, fiction and nonfiction books. His latest book is a thriller called Until They Bury Me. He's also the host of two podcasts, Offshore Sailing and Cruising with Paul Trammer, and Dream Chasers and Eccentrics. Wow, Paul, how is life in the boat? <laughs> oh, it's wonderful. It's it's a dream. I'm I'm living my dream out here for sure. I, I enjoy. It. I know. Like I'm so jealous. I want to be on that boat. So, <laughs> thank you for joining us today, Paul. And uh, and of course, my first question is going to be about the boat. So, how long have you been living on the boat, Paul? I bought this boat in 2019, uh, right after I sold my house. So I sold my house first, and then went boat shopping. And I've been living full time on this boat since October of 2019. So almost four years now. Oh, uh, wow. Well, what made you decide to live this, you know, unconventional lifestyle, you know, just, you know, quit living in a house and live uh, on, on a boat? Well, I was in a, a stage of my life when I was just changing everything. And, you know, it all started in 2015 when I quit drinking. I used to be a big time partier. Uh, I drank beer all, you know, I drank a lot and I smoked a lot of weed and I was a musician and I was in a band. I was chasing a different dream at the time and it just got to be too unhealthy, too much. My life was kind of going downhill and I got sober and I just changed everything about my life and sailing became a substitute for all the partying and all the good times. And uh, I just got really hooked. I had a different boat at the time. I had a, I bought a smaller sailboat and I spent two months with it in the Bahamas. And I loved it. After two months, I, I wanted more. I, I was wondering if, you know, if I was going to be worn out and ready to go back to land and tired and dirty and beat up. But I wasn't. I felt great. And I remember thinking like, yeah, I could live like this. And that just started the dream. And as soon as I figured out how to make, you know, how to put all the pieces in place, I pulled the trigger. You know, I, it only took about uh, well, one more year. That was in 2018, the Bahamas trip. And within a year, I had renovated my house, sold it sold my boat, quit my job, and was driving around in my Suburban looking for a boat, looking for a bigger boat to live on. And I found Windflower up in Massachusetts and bought her and ended up in the Bahamas. And I've been, I've been to the Bahamas, Florida, up the East Coast, to Canada, to Newfoundland, to Panama, Jamaica. I've, I've, um, I'm just checking out this whole part of the world here, going anywhere I want to go. Do you live alone? Yes. Do you have friends and family visiting or it's it's only you? No, nobody nobody's come to visit me on the boat yet. Uh, they, okay. They've all got their own lives. They're all busy. <laughs> you know, my my brother and sister both have kids and and um they've got busy lives and uh my parents have come out to see the boat a few times and have been on it. And I took my sister and her family sailing on my other boat once. But no, I'm just out here by myself doing my own thing and uh and really enjoying it. Um Does it ever get lonely? No. I don't get lonely. And when I when I want to be around people, there's all if I'm at anchor, there's always other people around, almost. And sailors are very uh, friendly and social, and you can just you can just take your dinghy over to someone else's boat and introduce yourself and make a new friend. It's it's pretty easy, and we all communicate. We all end up communicating via social media. And uh, you know, here here in Panama, for instance, I'm in Boca del Toro. There's a lot of other boats that are here for the entire hurricane season, so we all get to know each other. We surf together and spearfish together, and but I prefer 
being alone a lot of the time and, and being a writer, it's, it's ideal. I have all the time. I never have to ask someone else to leave me alone or to be quiet. It's always <laughs> quiet on the boat, you know, and, yeah. and, and run podcasts. And I'm also recording audio books. You know, I need silence a lot of the time. Ah, oh, fun. Uh, so, so being on a boat solo is, is ideal for that. And I actually enjoy sailing solo. It's, it's really a, a huge adventure. Every time I go somewhere, you know, it's just me in the boat. Everything's up to me. I'm responsible for everything. I'm, I'm accountable for everything. And it's always peace and quiet. And when things get ugly and scary and rough, I don't have anyone else to think about. I don't have to think about someone else's safety or, or deal with, you know, I mean, I just deal with life better by myself. That's what it comes down to. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. Any pets? Do you have any pets on the boat? No, no. I had a dog. I had a dog for 13 years. And when he passed, I thought, okay, now if I really want to do some serious traveling, I can. And it wasn't too much long after that, that I ended up, I started sailing. People have dogs on boats and some people have cats, but it's a big deal. You know, you have to go to shore to walk your dog a couple, you know, a few times a day, you know, that's a, that's a big deal when you live on a boat. I don't go to shore. I, I don't go to shore more than once a week, usually. Ah, I see. I my time in the water. My, my recreation is in the water. I, I've, I, I uh, spear fish and I surf. Those are my two main recreations. Oh. And uh, I don't need to go to land very often. Oh, fun. So yeah. um, now I want to talk about being a writer on, on a boat. And you said that you, you enjoy the silence, you, you need to focus. So how is being on a boat influenced your writing? And do you include being a sailor in, in your... Fi- I know you wrote a nonfiction book as well, but in your fiction book, do we see lots of sailors, <laughs> lots of sea stories, or how, how does that affect your, your fiction? Well, let's see. The, I've written three novels, and I'm working on a fourth. One of the three that I've already published, uh, called The Gold Box, is is about a sailor. So uh, absolutely influenced. That that book is sort of a fictionalization of of uh, of, of my time in the Bahamas. One year, um, I I'm always looking for treasure when I'm spearfishing. Of course, oh. who wouldn't? <laughs> I've never found anything. Yeah, that's well, but, but yeah. why wouldn't you? You're down the what, bottom. What kind days, of treasure? You know? What what kind of treasure would you find? Like you're looking for gold, like yeah, from gold ancient, balloons. like from yeah, ancient from pirates. times, <laughs> from pirates. Yeah, oh wow, yeah, from pirates. Yeah, I mean, I'm in the Caribbean. There were a lot of there was a lot of gold moving through here when I, you know back in let's say the 15, 16, 1700s. Uh, I mean, basically, the Europeans were looting the gold of, of South America, and they were moving it through here back to Europe. And so there's a lot of shipwrecks in the Caribbean, because there's tons of reef, and there's a lot of places where pirates head out. In fact, right right next to me right now is a place called Bluefields, where the pirate Blauvelt uh, used to hide out. So the Caribbean's full of places where full-time pirates lived and stayed, and they would, they would attack boats and uh, steal, steal the gold and do do what they did with it but a lot of gold ended up on the bottom so there are a lot of, of real treasure hunters i'm not a real treasure hunter but there are a lot of real treasure hunters in the caribbean and they and they do find large amounts of gold so i'm always looking that's my point i'm always looking because why not so of course being a writer i think up scenarios and and, and it's a it's an interesting question what do you do if you're spearfishing especially with another person okay and you find a piece of gold right away you have to decide if you're going to tell that other person right because if you tell them, now they know about it. And once two people know about something, then then potentially the whole world knows because it's hard to keep a secret. So there's a lot of questions about what, what happens when you find something and what you do about it. And that just started the ball, roll, the ball rolling in my head for this novel, The Gold Box. And then the novel I'm writing now is also about a sailor. Uh, th- this one brings up the question of what happens when you bring a, a stranger on board. Ah. Uh, and and you, don't, you don't know them. Like in this book, a guy meets a, meets a woman. Because there's always there's always people who want free rides on sailboats. There's there's websites there's websites for that sailboat hitchhikers and and um, there's lots. I mean, I did it too when, when I was learning how to sail. I did that. Too. I took a I took a ride on a boat from St. Lucia to Puerto Rico, and I recently had a woman on board who was just wanting to travel and learn how to sail. So that got me thinking: what happens if that goes bad? You know, and uh, murder. So <laughs> <laughs> murder, <exactly. laughs> murder on a boat is always very cool because you know it's like you can like always dump the body in the water nobody would find out like Dexter. Would find out. Yeah, exactly 
Exactly. And the thing about the thing about man and a woman on a boat is you're trapped. You're stuck. You're stuck together. There's nowhere to go. You can't just walk away. When you're on land, if you're in a bad date, you can just leave. Or if you're even in a bad relationship, you live together. You can get in your car at any point and drive away and at least be separated or go walk. I mean, whatever. You can separate yourself. From the person. You can't do that on a boat. You kill each other. That's what happens. On a boat. That's what happens. Yeah. Somebody's yeah. going to end up in the water, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I, I hope it's not inspired by real events. <laughs> uh, you yes. know, it's, it's inspired by, by real events, but not the murder part. You know? <laughs> okay. the, the funny thing okay. is, when I, when I had this, this woman on, I had a woman on board last, last winter in the Bahamas, and my, my mother asked me to send her photographs of myself daily, daily. And I thought, what's up with this? Why does she want to see a picture of me every day? She must think, she must be worried about my happiness. That's what I thought. So I talked to my father and he said, he said, oh, no, Paul, it's not, she's not worried about your happiness. She's worried this woman's going to kill you and throw you over. <laughs> <laughs> well, mother's, mother's instinct, you know. <laughs> yeah, and, and then she took it one step further. She was afraid that this woman was going to start texting, like responding to texts as if she was me. Okay. So she wanted photos. So that got me, that got me thinking, well, that's a novel. That's the start of a novel, right? Maybe your mother watches a lot of Dateline. I mean, I watch a lot something. of Dateline. <laughs> yeah, something that makes me a little paranoid. Yeah. 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 So, that's the, yeah, oh, so wow. that's the premise for the book I'm working on now. The, the working title for that one is Identity Crisis. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. That's very cool. That's very cool. So what was the craziest thing you've ever encountered you know, while you're living on the boat and did it make it in, in your books? Like the craziest story, like you saw, I don't know, a shark, a whale, uh, I don't know, a pirate, something crazy. Well, gosh, a couple of things come to mind. I mean, the craziest thing that happened to me was, and it did make it into my book, uh, Journey to the Ragged Islands. That's the, okay. that's the story about my first trip to the Bahamas uh, in my smaller sailboat when I was, when I was brand new to sailing. And I had, I had, a few near death experiences on that trip, but but what I, what happened on this one was I I see I didn't have a dinghy on that boat. I just had a twelve foot surfboard and a kayak paddle. So it's basically like a large paddle board with a, with a kayak paddle, and I would sit down on it and get around. And I got harassed by a giant shark once while on that board. I'm sitting on a surfboard with a kayak paddle and a massive oceanic white tip, which is a species known to eat people, uh, just swam right up to me and bumped into the surfboard and dragged its head along the board. Ah, oh, jeez. And then went away and came back and did that like four more, three more times. So four times this big shark was dragging its head along the side of my boat. So what it was doing was it was, it was basically sniffing and tasting the boat or the, the boat, the, the surfboard okay. to see if it was, to see if it was edible. Cause that's what they do. That's what oceanic white tips do. They investigate everything. That was terrifying. And that, that was probably the, that, that was the scariest thing that's ever happened to me. But, um, but another another story comes to mind when you said that here in Panama, uh, we're, a lot of us are here to surf, and you know this is Central America. Central America is is kind of like the Wild West in a lot of ways. It's not it's not quite as it's not quite as law and order as, as America. Okay, um, the people are a bit more rough, you know, uh, a bit more, you know. So anyway, there's one there's one surfer here who's kind of crazy and he doesn't like tourists, and he pulled a knife in the surf on one of my friends. Oh, tried geez. to run him off and literally had a knife. Like nobody carries a knife when they surf. That's crazy. That's like, that's like really crazy. Okay. Nobody does that. I've never heard of anybody. Like, why would you carry a knife when you're surfing? It doesn't make any sense. So he, he, he but this guy does. And he literally pulled a knife on my friend and I, you know, told him to go away. Like he didn't want him surfing there anymore. And then I find out that that character has actually stabbed somebody in the, in the oh. surf. Another, another local told me, oh yeah, that guy's been to prison for homicide and He's crazy, and he actually has stabbed someone before. <laughs> so that's the oh wow, that's the craziest thing. I, that's the craziest story I've heard so far. But um, yeah, as far as sailing goes, it's all it's all nature and and peaceful and wonderful. And um, you know, sometimes it's it's rough and uncomfortable, but it's rarely life threatening and terrifying. I've never encountered pirates. What about pirates? Do they still exist? I mean, the last time I heard of pirates was the Somali, the one from Somalia, and they made the movie about it. Was it with Tom Hanks? Was it yeah. that one? Yeah. Do they actually still exist? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, a pirate, like in our minds, a pirate is a you know a character in a Disney movie, but a pirate is just a, a criminal on, in a boat. Okay. Who, who robs you? So 
sometimes people get robbed at anchor. Like one of my friends' boat has been broken into just just a few months ago, right here in Panama. And then you do you hear stories about people at sea getting getting robbed while they're sailing. You know, they can they can steal your boat or they can I mean anything. Like there's no there's nobody to help you out there on the ocean. Anything can happen. Um you know, and people disappear off boats and we don't know no one knows why. But yeah, pirates do exist and they typically exist around poor countries where people are desperate. So if you have a situation where a, a country is desperate and there are people in that country with boats, fishermen, uh, then you have piracy. In fact, so right now, so we all kind of keep tabs on this right now in this area, nobody gets anywhere near Venezuela. And yeah, they're just, the country is just too desperate and the people with boats are are tempted to book to, uh, to, to piracy. So yeah, there's a pirate problem around Venezuela and also around Nicaragua. We all steer clear of Nicaragua right now. So if you're heading north from Panama, you got to go wide around Nicaragua. That that started after the last hurricane. So a few years ago, a, a Category 5 hurricane hit um, eastern Nicaragua. And uh, it, it's already a, a poor uh, area. So the, the, the hurricane did so much damage and devastation that you end, you end up with a population of, of desperate people who have boats. Uh-oh. And if, if, if they're out, you know, I mean, imagine yourself, you're, 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 you're desperate, you're poor, your family's hungry, you're out in your boat and you don't even have enough food to feed your family and you see a sailboat and the sailboat's pretty and nice and it's, and it just represents wealth to you. It's going to be tempting. Huh. So people get, uh, people get tempted. How do you protect yourself? Do you have weapons on the boat? No, when I, when I first started sailing, I had a gun, but it's just too difficult to, travel through foreign countries with guns you know some countries are easier than others but but a lot of countries you have to, i mean all of them you have to tell them you have a gun and then they want to see it or they want to take it and keep it while you're there and then you can get it when you leave so it's just too much trouble and then you got to think about what are you really going to do like when you're offshore yeah someone tries to board you you shoot them like i can see that but what about when you're at anchor and someone comes on your boat at night to steal your outboard motor or something from your dinghy are you really going to shoot them and if you do what you're risking is a life in a foreign country's jail mm. you don't want to risk you, that you can just scare them with the gun yeah you know we all, <laughs> I mean, well that's the other thing you pull a gun on someone and don't shoot they might have a gun and shoot you so oh, that's true. i don't know i i choose not to have one but you know what we all have flare guns and a flare gun is a gun it shoots a it shoots a burning flare (laughs) like it's a a gun too so there is that but um it's not something that is really an issue i don't really go to dangerous places like i stay like i love the bahamas there's no need to have a gun there everybody's friendly in the bahamas here in panama yeah there have been some instances here that you need to know about and you need to we all kind of keep tabs on where it happens we stay away from those places and we kind of tend to stick together right now i'm off by myself but i'm in a safe place i don't i don't feel threatened here Hmm. uh what do you eat on the boat? Okay, I eat a lot of fish because I spear fish. Yeah. So more <laughs> yeah, that's what I was not, thinking. Yeah, more often than not, dinner is either fish or lobster. Um, here in Panama, there's there's grocery stores close by and an abundance of fruits and vegetables. So I'm always eating fruits and vegetables here. In, in the Bahamas, you better be bringing all your own food. Uh, there's definitely, you're not going to find much in the way of fruit and vegetable there. And the food's all expensive, so. So when I'm going to places like that, I'll stock up on canned food and dried food, you know, rice, beans, uh, granola, a trail mix, oatmeal, uh, canned fruit, canned vegetables, canned chili, crackers. But staples for me are going to be oatmeal, trail mix, canned beans, rice. But here in Panama, it's, it's, it's delightful. I'm eating bananas and pineapple for breakfast and salads for lunch and Hmm. and uh fish for dinner i'm eating very well that's what i wanted to uh yeah so and how does that affect your like health do you feel more energy like now you're in nature you're yeah. eating fish i guess you don't eat much meat right like red meat or yeah i never i never buy red meat yeah because it's, it's expensive and, and i don't feel the need to I, I eat enough fish i love fish i mean fresh fish is the best fresh, fresh fish is really good it's it's, it's hard for someone who doesn't know that to understand because because fish once it's been a few days old isn't that good anymore and if it's been frozen 
it's just not that good anymore. It changes flavor a lot. Uh, some fish in particular, for instance, tuna or mackerel, you need to eat them like the first day you catch them, maybe the second day. But after that, they, the flavor really changes. Um, other mm. fish, not so much. But, it, but any fish is, is way better fresh than it is once it's been uh, frozen or, or sat in the fridge for a few days. So, How, how do you cook them? Like, do you, when you cook on the boat, do you grill them or like how, uh, what do you do when you cook them on the boat? So I have a, a three burner propane stove with an oven and uh, I, I typically just put the, um, I typically uh, saute some onions okay, and then some, then some bell pepper and some tomato. And then I put the fish in there with that okay, saute it in a pan, you know, pan fried with some veggies and some rice. That's a pretty Yummy. standard meal for me. Yeah. <laughs> Yummy. Yeah, uh-huh. that's what it was last night. It was gray snapper, and uh, you know, I, I started off with onions, and then bell pepper, like red bell pepper next, and then tomato and the garlic, and then I put the snapper in there, and then I put some beans, some beans and, and rice that I cooked in coconut milk, which is delicious. Uh, and all that together, and uh, and um, ah, it was mighty good. Yeah, fantastic. I mean, that's I eat better now than I ever have. Yeah. So you fish every day. So like every day you go and you basically bring your dinner from the sea. I, I spearfish almost every day when the conditions are good for it. Uh, sometimes I'll get a big fish and I won't need to spearfish for a few days. Mm, but, okay. But I'm often, I'm, I'm at least half the days. Like here in Panama, it's probably about half of the days I go spearfishing. Um, when, there's, when there's surf, I'm spending my time surfing. So there's, when this, there's, this surf is seasonal here. So when the surf is on, I'm, my, my, all my free time is surfing. But I can also catch fish with my rod and reel. Uh, right off my boat. Oh, very cool. So sometimes, especially at night, I have a light that shines down into the water off the bow of the boat. I can just go forward and, and catch fish at night whenever I want to as well. So oh, wow. that's pretty easy. Would you ever go back to living in a house? Uh, it might happen someday, but I have no plans for that now. I, I like it too much out here. Yeah, I mean, I'll get, <laughs> yeah. I mean, who knows? Things always change. Uh, but, but for now, no, I have no desire. I have a fear of having to go back to land. As a matter of fact, like I'm, I'm doing everything I can to uh, make sure I get to stay out here on the water because this is this is a good life for me. What What are you afraid of? Living in a house, <laughs> having to get a <laughs> having to get a job. Uh, oh yeah, mowing the lawn, maybe. You know. lawn, just just being stuck in the same house day after day, looking at the same, you know, having to drive. All all of you know what I really don't like about conventional living in a house is that you're completely cut off from nature yeah uh, out here on the ocean i'm surrounded by water i'm surrounded by nature when when the sun goes down it's dark when the sun comes up in the morning it's light uh I, there's birds there's fish there's no roads there's no telephone poles there's no concrete there's no other buildings it's, it's nature and that's what makes me happy so how do you sustain yourself like you live off your saving or like how does it how does that work financially uh, well, I've you know I've written ten books. They're all they're all published and making money. Uh, I make a little bit of money from the podcasts, but yeah, mainly I'm living off off writing right now. Oh well, that that's that's what I really want to ask about. So, first of all, uh, like for writers, it's really hard for them to make money off writing. So, how was your publishing journey? Did you self publish? Did you go through an agent? Uh, you know how. How did it go with you, and how are you marketing your books? I'm all self-published. I haven't even okay. tried to to uh, get an agent yet. I mean, I, I um I think about that every now and then, but but uh, I haven't heard. You know, I listen to a lot of interviews with authors on other podcasts, and I haven't heard anyone really say, "Oh yeah, definitely traditional publishing is the way to go." I hear a lot of people say, "I don't know, you know, I'm traditionally published, but uh, yeah. you know, I still have to do all my own marketing." And that's true. That's true. Blah blah blah. So I just don't really know if that's the worth all the trade. It seems like a lot of trouble too. <laughs> so I've been, yeah. yeah, I mean, how many how many cover letters do you have to write now? Exactly, <laughs> exactly. It looks it just looks like a terribly hard journey. So, and then the alternative is to spend one day, maybe two days, on the computer, and your books published through Amazon, and you get to keep sixty you know, percent of the royalties. That's pretty. That's that's always been what I've done. So. Do you it's hire an editor? Do, did you hire an editor and cover designer, or how how did you how was the whole process for you? Uh, no, I haven't hired anybody yet for either of those two things. I always have a, a few people read my books, okay, um, to, to help me to help me edit, and then of course I edit extensively myself. 
Um, and then now I, I read out loud. Uh, now I now the final step, like for when I, for until they bury me, for instance, the, right before I published it, I recorded it as an audio book, which meant I had to read it out loud. And uh. you really catch mistakes that way. So that's my final edit is is reading it out loud and recording it because you have to you see every word, you see every comma, every period. Um, but I always have friends friends help uh, to edit, and uh, that works. That works fine. You know, I, I still see typos in traditional yeah, published books. Too, that's so true. That's true. It's not foolproof. Yeah, either way is foolproof. I've designed all my own covers except for the gold box. A friend of mine did that cover, and that's that's actually a really nice cover. But the rest of the covers I did. So, how are you marketing these books? Like, I think marketing a book and convincing people to you know swipe their credit cards and and buy your book is really hard i mean uh you know i have a podcast i have like a huge following on social media but i still i'm still like you know having a hard time selling a, a book because people would like like and retweet and whatever and share but when it comes to actually buying yeah. the book it's so what what is your secret is it the fact that you're a sailor? <laughs> People like uh, yeah, sailors. Gosh, I wish I knew the secret. Um, I mean, I'm. I, I need to sell more books too. Uh, so all I do is this. I mean, the same thing you're doing basically. I, I I promote on social media. I have two podcasts, um, and I have a YouTube channel. I have a YouTube channel too. Okay. Yeah, the YouTube channel is all right, especially for the nonfiction. So, for instance, for um, Journey to the Ragged Islands. For that book, while I was writing it, I was taking video. So I was out in, on the boat on this, on this to me, an incredible journey from Florida to the Bahamas and through the Bahamas. I was brand new. I was not an experienced sailor. I was making mistakes. I was doing stupid things. And I was taking video the whole time. And I made a video series that went along with the book. And, of course, that's pretty good advertisement for the book. Yeah. Also, sailing nonfiction is easier to sell at least for me, than novels. Like novels, I find very difficult to sell. Um, but, but sailing nonfiction, you've got an audience that's hungry for information, and you've got an audience that's uh, educated, intelligent people that have money. And they're not afraid to buy a book. Pe people who want to sail offshore are readers. We're all, we're all book readers. Most of all of us are. And uh, we, we're, hung we're all hungry for more information because we're all, we all want you need a ton of information in your head to take a sailboat offshore and, and feel confident doing it. And one way to do that is to read sailing nonfiction. So that's uh, that's more of a captive audience. Yes, yeah, so those those books are kind of my bread and butter. They they consistently sell, uh, but they don't sell a lot. You're never gonna get you're never gonna get wealthy um, selling sailing nonfiction. So I also write novels, and you know hope hope to. Uh, move up to the next level to the novels, but you don't have a captive audience with novels. You've, you've got, you're in a, you've there, you've got a whole lot more competition. It's much more difficult. Uh, the audiobooks help people. People tend to, um, yeah, to like the audiobooks. I just started doing that. And right away I'm selling more audiobooks than, than, uh, print for, for my, for my latest novel until they bury me I sold more, more audiobooks than print. So how do you do it? Do you record it yourself and then you sell it to Audible? How how does the process work if you're a um, self-published author? Okay, so for an audiobook, you go you go to um, Audi Audible, and their their website is ACX, and you gotta you gotta spend a day reading and deciphering everything they tell you. It's it's very it's very daunting. Uh, it's hard to figure out. You need a good microphone. I've got this. Uh, this shore on a boom right here. Ah, uh, okay. This is this is this is a this is a good microphone. You got to have a pop filter. You got to have it on a boom like this. Ah, uh, I see. Uh, okay. I also podcast with it. The great thing about this mic is it's directional. You have to be right here for it to pick up anything. It doesn't pick anything up. Okay. Elsewhere, so it's it's it's, it's good for. And that's what this is too. This is soundproofing behind me. <laughs> this is my uh, little studio. I see. Oh, it's falling I see. on me. Okay. Uh, so anyway, yeah, you go through Audible, you go through their program, you record each chapter individually. Uh, they tell you if there's anything wrong with it, usually. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes you finish the whole book, and then they send you an email saying, oh, there's a problem. There's this very vague problem with your entire book, and then you have to go and figure out what that is. And it can be really difficult. But 
you know, in the past five months, I've, I've recorded four books and I'm on my fifth right now. So, <clears throat> you know, I'm getting it done. It's a lot of work, but I'm getting it done. You can also have someone else do all that and split the money with them. There's a whole bunch of people on Audible who are who are offering contractors. their services. Uh, yeah. yeah, contractors. What what they typically want is half the royalties or cash up front or a combination of both. So I'll be as soon as I get all my books done, I'm gonna I'm gonna offer my services there too for just an extra source of income. Ah, uh, yeah, that's a good gig. Yeah, yeah. So if you have a book and you want to make an audio book and you don't want to record it, you can have somebody else do it. But you're going to be yeah. giving up half half the royalties. So I can hire a narrator and I, as well. Yeah, and I tell that person. Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah, they'll, I'll, they'll I'll probably do work. that. Yeah. I'll yeah. Prob- I mean, why not? It, it's a it's a whole it's another source of income. I mean, some people only listen to audiobooks. I listen to a lot of audiobooks uh, as well because I'm like busy with three kids and everything. So that's sometimes that's the only time I have is I listen to audiobooks while I like you know make dinner or whatever, walk the dog. It's it's you know, especially nonfiction. I like listening to nonfiction uh, on audiobooks. Yeah, well now now I really want to live on a boat. Yeah, <laughs> it's really nice <laughs> life. It's like you know, just yeah. eating fish and you know, <laughs> being People attacked don't... by sharks. <laughs> like... Yeah, hey, it's it's good living. I mean, it's 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 also kind of like camping. Don't don't forget. Yeah, I love I camping. Yeah. You know, I'm in yeah. I'm in Panama. It's it's uh, 85 degrees every day, and I don't have air conditioning. So you got to be okay with that. I just I don't want to do the work. I just don't want to do the work. I just wanna, I just want to sunbathe and read. <laughs> just, somebody yeah. else can do the work. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you need to find a lonely. You need to find a lonely guy with a boat. Who wants, yeah. who wants, who wants a wife? He's a, a writer with three kids. I know. <laughs> that is funny. Uh but yeah, so wow, this is this is fascinating. Are there any other author sailors or like are you is your story unique? No, there's definitely other author sailors. There are yeah, I like I met uh John Kretschmer last year when I was in Canada. He's a he's a very accomplished author sailor and a very accomplished sailor. A fascinating character. He's he's written some great books and he's uh he's a great guy. And uh, he sailed more miles than I'll ever sail. All, all he does is just sail laps around the Atlantic with, with paying customers. That's kind of his gig. He has people that pay to sail with him. He's that good of a sailor that he has people that pay to come onto his boat and sail from Bermuda to Canada or, or, and then to Scotland and then, and then to the Mediterranean and then from there to the, to, to the, to the uh, Caribbean. So I met him when I was in Canada. He was taking customers from, from Nova Scotia to uh, Newfoundland, and then he went to Greenland from there, and then to Iceland, and then to Scotland. Um, so, yes, yeah, so there's there's a there's a handful of sailor authors for sure that are doing it full time. I've he's the only one I've actually no I have I've met I've met one other I met Amy I can't remember her last name I met another another author who lived on a catamaran and she wrote uh, romance ah female oh, wow. ah ah yeah, romance, was, romance novels on a sailboat on a sailboat that that can get a bit dicey okay <laughs> sure <laughs> uh, I think romance ro- romance is huge uh, so if you have a romance on a sailboat that's she's probably making a killing yeah I know maybe I should start writing romance novels that's one of the biggest <laughs> I know that's one of the biggest selling genres right now. Colleen Hoover is selling now more than the Bible, I think, more than Stephen King. <laughs> uh, it's and, and yeah, she started it's actually she started as a self published author and then through TikTok she became huge. And I read a few of her books. They're actually they're quite good. I mean, I'm not really into romance, but they're they're entertaining and fun. Um, so I would, you know, I would buy more of her books. So you said you use social media, right? Where yeah. do you think you get the most attention and most like the highest ROI on which social media where like you focus your attention on one platform and then you get, you know, the highest, the the biggest result, which in your case is sales. Where do you think you get the biggest success on social media? I think it's been um, Facebook, but Facebook. Oh, interesting. But it might be YouTube because here's the deal. When I, when I lived on land, I had good internet. And I made that video series, Journey to the Ragged Islands. And then Journey to the Ragged Islands was a, a big seller in 2018. And that's what convinced me that I was going to be able to make a living 
writing books and sailing. Then I started sailing and I didn't have good internet anymore. So I quit making videos. And then just recently I got Starlink and now mm. I can make videos again. Because it takes a lot of, it takes a lot of uh, b- bandwidth to upload a video to YouTube. Um, with Starlink, it's no problem. And if you're at home on your computer and you have good internet, it's no problem. But trying to do it through the internet on your phone, it doesn't, it doesn't work. So, um. so I'm back on, I'm, I'm back on to YouTube. Okay. And, uh, because I think that was very, very effective for me, uh, especially with I sailing did. because, because there's a lot of people who videos, like sailing yeah. videos. Yeah. Sailing YouTube channels are hugely popular. Uh, uh. now, now with some genres, it's TikTok for romance. It's definitely TikTok. I, I tried TikTok for a little while and, and got frustrated with it and quit. But uh, yeah, some some authors say TikTok is it, but it depends yeah. on your genre. Yeah, it depends on your genre. As far as I know, like romance is huge on TikTok, and there's a couple others. Fantasy, but, um, I think. yeah. But, but I don't think sailors are into TikTok. What about Instagram? You know, with yeah, all the I, pictures. Yeah, Instagram too, for sure. I, with I'm, all, I'm all the pictures, yeah. Much. Yeah, I'm on that just as much as sail as uh, Facebook. Yeah. I'm not sure which one is better. But yeah. the thing is you just you got to you got to get at, to do everything you can to make people recognize you you and your name and feel like they know you a little bit because people if they feel like they know you a little bit then they're more apt to buy your book. Podcasting is huge. Yeah. Um, that's that's prob- that might be the How biggest. do you make how do you make money from your podcast? Ads or Patreon. Patreon. Ah, oh, okay. And and people yeah. actually support it through they Patreon. Do. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Here, try try this. Get on. Go to Patreon and look up podcast, and it'll give you the most popular podcasts that are using Patreon right away. And then you can also see how much how many members they have, how many patrons they have. Mm. It's astounding. It is it is astounding. Some of the podcasts have thousands of patrons. Okay. And if you have thousands of patrons, that means each one is probably giving at least they're probably averaging five bucks a month per patron. Mm. So, and you that's, plug that's it thousands in of dollars every month, <laughs> and you plug that in the show notes, right? So you say like support me or oh yeah 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 yeah. I, I I you know at first I was timid about doing that, and now it's just <laughs> it just rolls out of my mouth every every intro and outro. Ah, you add it so, to the yeah, intro I, and the I, outro. I, okay. I always let people know, and then I also direct traffic to my website as much as I can, and that's where the links to Patreon are. Mm, so I've got okay. a website. The website's also important um, for, wow. for marketing books. So my website is not just my books; it's my books, it's my two podcasts. Uh, I've got a page that's all photographs of fish that I take underwater. Anything I can? Oh, a newsletter! I just started a newsletter. Wow, an you're author, busy. That's why. Newsletter. That's yeah. why you're not lonely on the boat. You're like you're very busy. I'm working every day. Yeah, I know. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. it's fun out here, but it's also it's a job. It's a full time job. You know, I spent I think I spent ten hours yesterday at work. Um, but I also but I also got in the water and went spear fishing. So, and I watched yeah, the like sunset. Living the Margaritaville life. <laughs> what, what was his name? He just uh, passed uh, yeah, away. Yeah, Jimmy Buffett. Jimmy Buffett, yeah. Uh, so are, are you like living similar life like him? I I, I guess so. I mean, I, I don't know what life Jimmy Buffett led. Uh, now, Margaritaville, no. I don't, I, one of the, the reasons I'm here is because I quit uh, drinking. So yeah, quit drinking, yeah. But, there's, no, uh, there's no tequila on my boat for margaritas. <laughs> But, uh, <laughs> can be non-alcoholic margaritas. There's, there's, you can do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, a lot of people live like that. A lot of a lot of people who are retired, um, they come out here and they and they don't have a job. They don't have a project. And um, I don't know what they do to have fun because, like, I I need work. I need a project. Even if I was retired, and you you're still young. I mean, you're still young. I, I think you're still young to retire. No, I mean. Still... Oh yeah, I'm not retired yet. I'm I'm 52. Yeah. But uh, yeah. I'm. I'm uh so I'm still working. I, absolutely, I don't have I don't have a big nest egg to retire on. Um, I'm, I'm building that. I'm building that now with my books. Ah, oh, wow, that's that's very inspiring. I'm gonna go Google sailboats now. <laughs> See how I'm gonna escape. I'm just joking. Uh, yeah. But yeah, but this this has been wonderful, Paul. Um, any final thoughts for the audience? For anyone who wants to, to quit the life here uh, on land and write books on a on a, on a sailboat, yeah, yeah I, you know it's all about baby steps. 
you, okay. you, you, you want it, if you want to do something, then dream about it and keep dreaming about it and start taking small steps, you know, make a plan and start taking small steps towards that plan. And eventually, you know, it might take a few years, but anybody who wants to leave land and, and do something different, change their life hundred percent can do it. It just takes a lot of small steps. Yeah, but once you start making true. progress, you realize, wow, I'm really on the road to making this happen. And you get confidence. Each, each step builds the confidence. Eventually you're done and you're, you've sold the house and you've sold the car and quit the job and you live on a boat or, or whatever it is your dream is, you know, and you, you can make it happen. Wow, that's inspiring. Um, and best of luck with your, all your books. And I'm actually really uh, happy and inspired to hear that your books are doing well because many authors that I talk to, uh, you know, their their books are doing okay. Uh, and it's, it's inspiring to see that you're, you know, making a living uh, off your books and your self-published authors. So that gives other authors some hope. <laughs> So thank you yeah. very much and best of luck and stay away from all those sharks, okay? <laughs> stay, <laughs> I will. Thanks for having safe. me on, Tasha. And, and the pirates as well, okay? Oh, yeah. Uh, I have yeah. Them. Yeah. All right. All right. Thank you very much. And for anyone who's uh, listening or watching, thank you for joining us for an, uh, another episode of Read and Write with Natasha. And until we meet again. Thank you for tuning in to Read and Write with Natasha. I'm your host, Natasha Tynes. If today's episode inspired you in any way, please take the time to review the podcast. Remember to subscribe and share this podcast with fellow book lovers. Until next time, happy reading, happy writing.